Hi, this is Sarit Switzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 561 for the 17th of Sivan in a regular year. So I want to take you guys back quite a number of years ago to a really funny incident that happened to me. So this is uh, way back before I had had my current business, my current company, Bring the Gym to Me, and I was still kind of figuring out my career and having different jobs. And I often would have like a few jobs at the same time. So at this time, the two main jobs that I had were very different. <laughs> One of them was teaching gym at Base Rifka. I was the the gym teacher at Base Rifka. And the other one was working in a title insurance office. So as you could imagine, these two different jobs required me to dress very differently. So when I would go to teach gym, I would wear sneakers, I would have my hair back in a ponytail, I would wear like more sporty kind of clothes, right? Like kind of, you could imagine that. And then when I'd be in the title insurance office, then I would be a little bit more dressed up. Sometimes I'd wear heels, my hair would be down, I'd do my makeup, um, you know, I'd wear a little bit nicer clothing and that kind of thing. So there was this one time where my boss at the title insurance office wanted to introduce me into the art of selling title insurance. Up, on, up until this point, I'd been doing more like administrative stuff in the, in the office. And he wanted me to come with him on like a field trip and see how it was that he sold title insurance and maybe give it a, give it a go myself. So we, we decided to go for whatever reason on Tisha B'Av, <laughs> kind of a strange time to go, but I guess for whatever reason, we decided to go on Tisha B'Av and we went to Borough Hall, which was like the area where all of the, a lot of lawyers tend to be there. It's a very high concentration of lawyers. And we went door to door trying to sell title insurance. And so uh, of course, I dressed for the occasion and I wore nicer kind of clothes, like kind of like a suit jacket, I think, and like a, a black skirt and and heels and uh, like uh, and all of that. And so we went around the whole day selling title insurance. And by the end of the day, it was again, Tisha B'Av, we were both quite exhausted. And the boss asked me if I would like to go to a Chabad house that was nearby and we could go there and break the fast there that he was familiar with. So I said, sure, let's do that. So we went to this Chabad house and we're sitting there and, you know, they're preparing all the food to break the fast. All of a sudden, this little girl walks in and she starts staring at me with wide eyes <laughs> and like as if she had seen a ghost. And she just starts pointing at me and she says, what are you doing here? And I look at her and I see that she's one of my students from Base Rifka, one of my gym students. And she says, you're my gym teacher. What are you doing here? <laughs> and she was so confused. And she was really like, just like really startled by the fact that her gym teacher could be in a totally different context, look very different, be dressed really differently. Like she did not know how to process this information. How could it be that her gym teacher is here, not in the gym, wearing fancy clothes and not doing gym stuff. How it, she, it was really hard for her to process this in her mind. So at the time, I really thought of it as like a very comical incident and sort of like this really funny merging of my, of my two worlds. Uh, and so it, this story came back to me when I was studying the Tanya today, when I was preparing for this episode, because it really pointed to me on this interesting fact of how it is that we, all of us wear many hats in our lives. And at times these hats like might more apparently have some kind of connection with one another, uh, be somehow interconnected. But at other times they might actually appear to the outside world as very opposite. Like we can have like 
let's say me, for example, even right now, even in my current state, it's like, here I am. I, I give over these Tanya episodes. This is one part of my life. And then another part of my life is running my business. Another part of my life is practicing yoga. I have all these different aspects of my life, which to an outside observer, if they only know me within one context, if they only know me in terms of giving over these podcast episodes, they might not be able to contain or to be able to understand how the same Sarid who teaches uh, Tanya uh, at, in this podcast format is the same Sarid who practices yoga on a daily basis and is the same Sarid who runs a, a company, a fitness-based company. But of course, once people really get to know me and once people get to understand that those are different sides of me, it actually widens their perspective of who I am. And it actually they actually can learn that this isn't really a contradiction. And actually, all of these things can be true at once. And it's not that Sarid is podcast host, Sarid is yoga practitioner, Sarid is business owner, but there's Sarid and then she has all of these different aspects of herself in terms of how she chooses to relate to the world. So to translate this into Tanya and what we're going to be talking about today, and we, we began talking about it already quite a bit, is that the same is true for God, that God expresses himself in a multi multitude of different ways in terms of his relationship with us to the world. However, it really is all one God. And even if it might appear at times that the way that he relates to us is not only really different, but even contradictory, it's really the same God. It's coming from the same place. So we've been discussing this in the past few episodes about how really fundamentally all of God's attributes can kind of be put into these more umbrella categories, these two bigger umbrella categories of the right side and the left side, which are epitomized in two in God's two very essential names of his of the Tetragrammaton, the Havaya, Yud Kei Vav Kei, the four letter name of God, and the name Elohim. Which again, we've been just for a little bit of a review, we've talked about how the name Havaya, the first one, is indicative of God's ability to expand, God's ability to create, God's ability to reveal, and how everything is really an expression of him. And then the second name, the name Elohim, is by contrast, God's ability to constrain himself, to limit himself, to hide himself, to conceal himself in the world, so that we actually can experience ourselves as created beings and not be nullified out of existence. And so the thing, the point that the ultra upper really is going to want to emphasize today is really about how these two attributes are really inclusive and how they're not like, while it might seem that they're really different and that they're two very different gods, God forbid, they're really coming from the same place. Just like Sarid back in the day was both title insurance agent and gym teacher. And those two things were not a contradiction to each other. They were both me. They were both very essentially me. I am currently a podcast host. I practice yoga. I also run a business and I, I do a lot of other things too. And all of these things really are me. They're, they're, they're truly me. And so this is really what the ultra Rupa wants to emphasize to us today is this idea about how it's all one God. And this is really the ultimate thesis of this entire book of the Shari Yechud Ba'amuna is about this essential unity of God. And in understanding this essential unity of God, another important component to recognize is the fact that while all of these different facets of God are really all coming from the same God, none of them really define God in an essential way. Like God is not defined by any of these things. And in fact, all of these different manifestations of God are truly nullified to who he is himself. Again, going back to the analogy of me, uh, when we we're talking about me as title insurance agent or me as gym teacher, neither one of these things, like even though they were both coming from me and they were both manifestations of Sarid, of the essential me, neither one of them really defined me in a true sense. And neither one of them, we can't really even say that either one of these things were like a subcategory of me, like in any really truly definitive way. Like at the end of the day, I am I. I'm not defined by anything I do, by any manifestation that I have. There's there's an essential me that is beyond all of these things in a true way. And that's the same thing with God, Lahavdiel, that God is not defined by the world. He's not defined by his creations to the point that all of his creations are totally nothingness. They're totally uh, nullified in comparison to him.
So like by way of contrast, something that the ultra rubber is going to bring here to help us understand like what it would look like if something were to be, were to have like a real connection and were to be some kind of like, have some kind of actual relationship to the, the sort, the thing itself is like in the case of the body and the soul. So like in the, in case of the body and the soul, we can say that the body is subservient to the soul. So the body is like sort of like subordinate to the soul. The soul is somewhat kind of like overpowering the body. However, we wouldn't say that the body is nullified to the soul, like to the same extent that the world and and all of creation is nullified to God because ultimately the soul did not create the body. The body is not just like, it does not come about as a result of the soul. The soul might be vivifying the body and animating the body, but it's not actually bringing it into existence, something from nothing, the way that God does that for the world. So let's get into the text. And for context, we are still in the middle of chapter six of Shari Chod Mamuna. And so here we go. So the altar of it begins and he says that, it's through this understanding about the inclusion of these different mitos, one with the other, that we can really come to understand how God and his garments are one and the same. So meaning to say that we had already began talking about this in, in previous episodes about this idea, and really mostly yesterday, about this idea about how when we see God's severity and when we see God's kindness, they might seem to be very different things for us, but these two things are actually just both manifestations of the same one God. And the reason why, and so what the ultra is teaching us today is that the reason why this is so essential for us to know is that through understanding how these two manifestations these these different mitos are essentially are interincluded with one another meaning that they're not actually as different as we might have thought this can actually allow us to appreciate how god is really one so again just as a review from yesterday so remember we ended off and we talked about how when we see god appearing in a severe manner it's actually not severity. It's actually really a manifestation of his kindness. It just appears to be severity. Just like we gave the analogy of a parent who's telling the child to go to sleep and shut off the TV and stop eating candy. It might appear superficially that the, the parent is being really harsh and severe with the child, when really it's also an expression of love. Just like with this, just the, it's the same love as the as the parent gives to the child when the parent is hugging and kissing the child. That's that same love, even though superficially it manifests as harshness. So similarly with God too, that when we understand that God's severity and God's kindness are really interincluded with one another, they're not as distinct as they might appear at first glance. This will give us an appreciation of God's unity because it's only because of the fact that these different attributes of God are totally united with God that allow them to be comprised with one another. Just like, again, in the analogy of the mother, that is, it's only because like the mother is both, it's the, it's the same mother that is giving candy to the child and also taking away the candy from the child, that this same, that the fact that both of these actions are coming from the same mother point to the fact it's, it's what allows these two actions to really be manifestations of the same thing. And then the altar here quotes uh, quotes from uh, Tikkuni Zohar, where it says, "V'antu de kashir lon u'yached lon chule uvar minach leit yichuda be'la'e chule." So, which that's in Aramaic, and what it literally means is, "And you are he who binds them together and unites them, and apart from you, there is no unity amongst these these attributes above." So, basically, meaning to say that it's not if not for the fact that they were coming from the same place, they would not be included with one another. Like if it was not the same mother who was telling the kid to go to sleep and telling and giving the, the kid a, a hug, then we wouldn't necessarily know that they're coming from the same place. Maybe the if it was two separate people that were doing this, then perhaps the person that's telling the kids to go to sleep really is not the nicest person. Maybe it's like, you know, a, a nanny who doesn't have the best intentions. She just wants to go to sleep early herself, you know, or, or rest. And so now the ultra goes on and he says that this, all of this, everything we've been talking about is the meaning of the phrase, which we've mentioned before of This is from Jerarim chapter 4, verse 39, where it says, mm-hmm. And this is from the prayer, the Aleinu prayer that we say, where it's, it means that you should take it, you should plant it into your heart, that God is, that 
the God is God, which to be more literal, it's that Hashem, the Yud Kei Vav Kei, is Elohim. They're both the same, meaning that meaning that both of these different names are actually one and the same. Because even the name Elohim, which alludes to this idea of the symptom of this constriction and this concealment of the light, is chesed, just like the name of Havaya. Because God's attributes are united with him in total unity. And so him and his name is, are one and the same because his attributes are his names. So thus... You should anyways know, like by extension of this logic, you should come to understand that that in the heavens above and the earth below, there is none other. So we, we mentioned that in a previous episode when we started out this Sefer of Shari Yochud Vemunah. And so to understand this in the context of what we've been discussing thus far here is that even this physical land that we live in, this material earth, which looks like a total something to everybody, like we all we all see it, we can touch the, the world around us, it's, it's very tangible, is actually totally not in nothingness in comparison to God himself. Because the name Elohim does not actually conceal or, uh, or, or constrict anything other than to our eyes. So the only way that we, that, like the fact that we see this world, which Again, the wor- this world is connected in, in nature, is connected to the wor- to the name Elohim, as we, we mentioned previously in a previous episode, how they both have the same numerical value. So to our eyes, it's uh, it, it, it appears that God is very much concealed here, but that's only to our eyes. But from God's perspective, because he and his name are one, then him and the name Elohim are one and the same. Just like going back to, again, the analogy of the little girl seeing me not wearing gym clothes. To her, it seems like that being a gym teacher is very me. It's like, that's what defines me. Like, that's what she sees is gym teacher. She didn't see Sarid. She sees gym teacher. And now she's seeing title insurance agent. Really, that's only from her perspective. From my perspective, I'm the same Sarid, whether I'm wearing gym clothes or business clothes, same, same street at the same time. So same thing. It's the same God. It's not the fact that we don't perceive God in the way that he truly is down here. doesn't mean that he's not very, very much present here. And this is why we can understand that th- this entire earth and everything underneath the earth are really all considered as if not in nothingness compared to God in his true sense. And this is why this world are, are not actually called a shame at all. They're not actually called a name. Even the name of Od, which is a like a kind of like subordinate, subordinate type of status of a name. So meaning to say that like, so just to understand that it's like basically the ultra was saying that when we look at the world, we, somebody might like think to themselves like, okay, the world is like, we understand that it's not like God, like in the full extent of God, but it's like, it's an aspect of God. Maybe, maybe it's like an aspect of God, just like maybe that the, uh, that my student could have thought like maybe, okay, she understands that Sarita is multifaceted. So like being a gym teacher is like, it's like an aspect of her, like part of me is part of Sarid in a defined way is gym teacher. And what the ultra is saying here is like, is no, that's actually not true. It's actually like being that beingness, that manifestation of the world is actually not God at all. Like it's, 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 it might be a way that he brings himself into revelation here, but it's not truly who he is. So meaning that again, like in the analogy of, of me, it could be that there's a, an aspect of me that is sporty, we could say maybe, and that is like athletic, but like to actually say like gym teacher is like, that's like already too far of a leap. That's already like, it's like, no, that's, that's not me. That's not, I, I'm not defined by that. I'm not defined by my profession. You hear people say that a lot of times, right? That they don't want to be defined by their profession. It's like they want to really be defined by who they are. So it's the same thing. It's like here in this world, this world is not something that we can even say is any kind of de- definition of God, even to the extent of it being like a very subordinate type of definition. And then the ultra rabbit brings like, um, he he wants to explain what we mean by this de- subordinate status and like kind of explain what, what the world is not in that sense. Like, 
like what like what would be something that would be considered to be a subordinate status. So he says that, for example, there's a, this word ve'od, which uh, which we're talking about that connotes the subordinate status. We find it actually in the Gemara, um, and he quotes here from Kiddushin, page six a, where it says Yehuda ve'od likra. So this is a a Gemara. This is a Talmudic phrase which is used to describe when there's like a superfluous proof so it's like let's say if somebody if there's a proof that's brought in the Gemara and then somebody else brings like another proof for that then there's this phrase that comes out where it says Yehuda ve'od likra which literally means like Yehuda is like an additional thing to the scripture like why why do we need this uh this additional proof from the scripture like it's kind of like unnecessary and so this word ve'od is connoting this unnecessary status it's like uh it's pointing to the subordinate status of the second proof and then the altar ever says there's another example of this would be like and when we look at the body in relation to the soul and the vitality that's inside of the soul and for this he brings a uh, a verse from tehillim chapter 146 verse 2 which says which literally means i will praise god with my life I will sing to my God, be'odi. So what's be'odi? Be'odi is with my body. But be'od, again, it's that same phraseology of od, of extra. So it's meaning to say that the the life force is coming from this, um, from the name Havaya, the first name of God, and the od is the body. So like, meaning that, which which is called the name Elohim. So meaning that like, basically what, what the altar is trying to point out here is that this verse is hinting at the fact that that the body is subordinate uh, to the neshama, but it's subordinate. So there, it's saying that it's subordinate means that there's some kind of relation to it, relationship between the two things. And this is because the only reason why we can say that there's a relationship between between the neshama and the and the body, and like that there's some kind of like parallel to them, is because the the soul did not bring the body into existence, something from nothing. However, when we talk about God and about how God creates everything, something from nothing, then everything is batalbumtsias. Everything is nullified in its source in relation to God, more like the light in relation to the sun, as the light is within the sun. So meaning to say that um, there really is no, maybe relationship isn't the right word, but there's no comparison. Like we cannot compare like th- the world to God and we can't say that there's that the world is truly like a any kind of manifestation of God in any true sense at all even if we say it's in a very subservient and sub, and uh, subordinate sense because it's it's it doesn't it it's has no existence like apart from God like its entire existence is coming something from nothing from God which is not the case when we look at the relationship between the body and the soul the soul didn't create the body even though the soul is manifesting itself within the body so thus we can say that the soul that the body is subservient to the soul the soul isn't like it's not like the uh it, it doesn't all it's not this all-encompassing thing that also includes the body so I know that was a lot, but just to kind of bring it all together, the main point, just to bring it back home that the ultra is trying to teach us here is to really make us recognize the fact that when we talk about God's different attributes and especially his two essential attributes of his of Yudke Vavke, which is this ability to expand, and by contrast, the Elohim, which is the ability to contract, these two attributes are coming from the same place. And this is why truly, while they might manifest to us as very different things, they're actually truly manifesting the same thing just in a different kind of way just like again going back to that analogy of me and meeting my student is that to her while it might be really conflicting things to see me as gym teacher and to see me as title insurance agent to me neither one of these terms define who I am and each one of these things are really just expressions of the essential me and there's this essential me that's beyond both of these things that's the source of both of these things so that's it for today and We'll continue along these lines tomorrow in this chapter, and I'll speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarid Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzchak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. 
To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.